There isn't another building probably in the world that you could walk into and see live Antarctic krill. So you are genuinely honoured. I'm excited by it as well. Um, but what I'll do to start with is just pass over to Dr. So Kawaguchi, who, who is Mr. Krill when it comes to this aquarium, and he can tell you a little bit about the actual krill aquarium or the, the krill display we have here tonight. Now, krill is a, uh, an animal which, is, which lives for about five, six years. They are the key species of the Antarctic ecosystem. That is because the uh, biomass of krill is really, really huge. Uh, they are, uh, there are about uh, several hundred million to billion tons of krill, and that's almost equivalent to the total weight of the human beings on the planet. So it's quite a huge amount. And they are, you know, the main food for, you know, penguins and whales. But also, the another uh, thing is that they can actually feed a lot of the, uh, the tiny phytoplankton, which is the, uh, the plants, uh, plant cells, and then uh, they are, you know, the primary producers. So because they are consuming majority of those primary producers, and then package it into their body, and then passing the, the energy to the, um, the higher predators, they are actually the, the key to the Antarctic um, ecosystem. They can grow rapidly during the summertime when they have lots of food, but also um, when they have less food, uh, they cannot gr uh, grow much or even shrink. So it's really hard to, um, you know, um, get the handle on their um, growth rates and so on, which is very important for uh, fisheries management and so on. You can see that mold. They are crustaceans, so they. Uh, have to shed off their exoskeleton to grow their size. They shed their exoskeleton um, once every two or three weeks, so they do that for the entire life. Um, the first bit of my talk is a bit more about krill, introducing about krill, and then second half of my talk it will be about my research at the AAD Aquarium, and specifically about the effect of ocean acidification on Antarctic krill. This is a, a blow up of krill and as I said, you know, they have huge biomass of course and keystone species of the Antarctic food chain. But basically you can see these big eyes, these are the swimming legs, we call them pleopods, that they are beating very very strongly and also you can here see the feeding baskets. So by uh, moving these uh, front legs, they can sieve off the uh, phytoplankton very efficiently. Also, you can see the gills here, which is sticking out from their body, and that's really good ventilation. So, um, born to be uh, very active, breathe very well, eat a eat lot of food, and then uh, swim fast. So, that's the kind of um, feature of krill. They are uh, young. And they are more associated with the ice, sea ice, and especially um, underneath the ice where there is canyons and also the terraces. They, are, they love their places and then they huddle together and then hide within those uh, features. Um, and also because they are associated with the ice, they won't be driven away, driven away by the current because when they are young, they still don't have enough you know, swimming capacity to uh, swim against the current. So by being within the, those uh, features, they can stay together and uh, make sure that they aren't, you know, driven away the, by the current. The other thing, when you look the krill from the sky, this picture actually shows the, the, the scale of the krill pads and also how they are existing in the ocean. If you can see this brownish big patch that is a swarm of krills floating at the, uh, the surface of the ocean and what these are they are whales coming to the um, you know the krill patch to eat them 
and you can also see them you know, blowing and you can see a distinct uh, line here where when the, um, the whales approach the krill they actually try to move away not to be eaten so there are some kind of very dynamic uh, interactions between um, krill and whales well what makes krill so special and I think from my point of view, it's their behavior. Because of this, you know, social behavior, uh, they're always, you know, almost for their entire life, they are in the, in the group. So that means that, you know, it is, it is very easy access for the larger predators um, to uh, eat this uh, krill. And that's uh, why they are so special about, you know, um, being the good uh, food for the higher predators. If something happens to krill, you know, population or in the dynamics or the way they behave, it, it might have a very big implication to the value as a food source for the, you know, the higher predators. And also it might affect the, the amount of, um, you know, phytoplankton they sieve out of the water. So if anything happens, there might be a change in the um, structure of the ecosystem and so on. So it's really important that we understand how the krill are interacting with the environment and how they might be affected by the climate change and so on. Um, CO2 is a um, greenhouse gas that is affecting the, um, the atmosphere to uh, warm up. But also the other side of the story is that it's not only about the climate, you know, warming the, uh, the temperature. The CO2 itself also uh, will be dissolved into the ocean. As the, um, the CO2 being uh, dissolved into the ocean, what happens will be that uh, there will be a chemical reaction and in the end what happens is that the amount of um, carbonate which is important for the uh, shellfish to um, create their um, cell will decrease. But also the, um, the hydrogen ion will increase and then that will bring down the uh, pH. So that is why we call it ocean acidification. As the uh, CO2 increases in the atmosphere, the ocean um, pH goes down. And interestingly, the amount of CO2 that can dissolve in the uh, water or the ocean depends on this, uh, the temperature. So they are more likely to uh, dissolve in the cooler environment. So um, you know, ecosystem like Arctic or the Antarctic, uh, they are the, thought to be the first ecosystem to be affected by this um, ocean acidification. We know that Antarctic krill is a very important component of the um, ecosystem in the Antarctica and we are really worried that what may happen if this, you know, the CO2 increase, the, um, the pH goes down in the uh, Antarctic Ocean. So to find that out, we really need to do something about it. And um, that brings the importance of the experimental approach to uh, find out the effect. Luckily, we do have a research aquarium uh, dedicated for krill in the Australian Antarctic Division. The research aquarium actually started in the 1980s. And when it first started, it was just in a freezer lab. And we have to wear these freezer suits and uh, doing a very small scale in a beaker uh, doing the experiments. So it was very cold. You cannot stay uh, in that environment for more than 15 minutes or so. It was very, very harsh. But now what we have is like this. The lab is in a room, uh, room temperature and the water itself is only, only the water itself is cooled down to uh, zero degrees. And we have these sophisticated um, you know, instruments to comp uh, control the things. Because of this development, now we can uh, control the seawater temperature and uh, CO2 levels and all sorts of things to mimic uh, whatever environment which will be expected into the, uh, into the future. So that's why we can do um, many uh, interesting um, 
experiments uh, using our aquarium. Uh, as we walk in, we can see the main lab. Um, we do have, you know, microsco uh, microscopy to look into the, you know, the structure of krill. We culture phytoplankton as food for krill here. And as we walk into the, the main holding room, this is where we uh, keep our krill. This is a feeding time now, so the water is green, but actually this is a super clean water. The, uh, the, the green uh, color is because of the phytoplankton, the food. When you walk out this door, you can see lots of these uh, things. We, this is a plant to purify the water, filter out the water, so that um, krill can be always kept in a clean water because you know Antarctic water is very very clean. So using that kind of aquarium uh, we uh, started to do some experiments about the uh, impact. The krill lay eggs at the ocean surface and then what happens is that as the krill eggs develop it takes about five or six days to hatch out but what happens is that because uh, they are heavy, the krill eggs sink down to about 700 to 1,000 meters before they hatch. And then they have to swim up the water column um, to uh, start feeding. The other thing that we have to note is that carbon dioxide level in the water, it's not the same from this, um, the surface down to the bottom. It actually the carbon dioxide level increases uh, with depth. So even if the current situation, atmospheric uh, CO2 level is about 350 or 400, something like that. But if you go down the water column, it goes up to uh, 500 or 600. The krill eggs, as they sink, they are experiencing this already higher CO2 uh, compared to the, the atmosphere. Now, what happens in 100 years time? This is a business as usual scenario. So if, if we keep living in this way and not really do anything about controlling the emissions, probably the CO2 level at 300 meters, 400 meters will go up to about 1,400 ppm. What does it mean to the krill eggs and can they hatch out? We do have this fancy um, system that can generate high CO2 water at the same time six different CO2 levels so what we did was let the krill uh, lay eggs and distribute those eggs into the jars and then those jars will be put into a refrigerator with the um, right amount of CO2 level let them stay for five six seven days and see whether they hatch out and then after you know, um, one week or so, we will count the number of the eggs that ha they hatch out. And what we found out was that the hatch rate is quite good, up to about 1000 ppm. But as the um, CO2 level goes beyond that, the hatch rate rapidly goes down. And the early development is stopped. There's some deforming abnormal development uh, under the high CO2. This 1000 ppm is not that high um, if we think of the vertical distribution of CO2 as I indicated in the last slide. By using those informations, we can actually uh, come up with a risk map of the future hatching success in the Southern Ocean. And this is uh, some example after 100 years, after 300 years. Uh, RCP 8.5 is the scenario that uh, is a kind of a, a business as usual. Um, this is another scenario which uh, is medium to high emission. The point is that after 100 years, we will see the areas that krill might suffer uh, in uh, reproducing. The orange is about less than half of the current hatch rate can be achieved. So some of the areas might be a bit uh, bad. In 300 years, uh, years time, almost the whole area within the uh, Antarctic waters could be not really suitable for reproduction for krill. That's just only one, sto one side story because we just tested the hatch rates under uh, various CO2. 
but as I said, they have complex life history from the eggs until, until the adults. Uh, they will go through 12 different forms of their larval stages. So the effect of CO2 will be, of course, different uh, from time to time. Uh, to uh, get a full picture, I think we need to uh, test the uh, effect of CO2 throughout the, uh, the whole life history. And also, this is only the CO2, but also there's an increase in temperature and so on. What about sea ice? So there are lots of things to do to, um, to untangle what may happen um, in the uh, future uh, environment. Krill, as I said, they are the centerpiece of the Antarctic e ecosystem. They will be eaten by whales and seals and penguins. And there are sea ice. There might be warming, sea ice reduction, and also the, um, the increase of the CO2 in the ocean. So we really have to understand through a good science and predict what may happen to krill into the future. And also I'll just mention that in the ecosystem there is also a fishing boat there which also uh, behaves uh, like one of the predators on krill. And that's the end of my talk. I'll hand it over to Keith. To start off with, um, so I mentioned about the, the krill fishery, and I just want to give a, a quick breakdown of what goes on from, from this building in terms of managing the krill fishery. And to start off with, just a, a quick description of what CAMELAR is, apart from being a sort of difficult acronym, it's the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And it's, I, I did a little thing on um, ABC Radio last night and, and I described how the members, the member countries of Camelot, there's 25 member countries of Camelot, it's an international commission. Um, the 25 members' flags are above you here. All those members come here to this very room and agree, they'll do this again in October this year, and agree on fishing limits and regulations for krill in the Antarctic for next year. And we described it last night a little bit like the, the Parliament of Krill. So all the countries that manage the krill fishing come together and, and make decisions. They're not always easy to make, um, but it's, it's an international commission. It's based here in Australia, um, but it's not an Australian entity. So it's an international commission. Australia are, of course, a very important part of it. So what I'm going to talk about is the krill fishery, a little bit about the krill fishery, and a little bit about how it's actually managed so this is a sort of one slide history of the Antarctic krill fishery. In the, the bar graph shows the catches in each year in tons. You can see it started in the 1970s and has progressed up until today. The maps on the right hand side um, show where that fishery has taken place. The sort of red color shows there's more catch, the greens a bit less. And on that bar chart, you can see we have Area 48 and Area 58. The zone that Kamala manages that in those maps, it's about 10% of the world's ocean, so we divide it into different chunks to help be able to manage it. Area 58 is basically the bit on the, the right-hand side of the East Antarctic, and Area 48 is on the, the left-hand side, and the bit around the Antarctic Peninsula and in the southwest Atlantic. When the fishery started, it was predominantly the Soviet Union, and also to some extent Japan, but predominantly the Soviet Union. Um, and that big change from the sort of 1970s, 1980s, and the early 1990s, when you see that big change, and then the, the much lower catches afterwards, that, that was the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, Japan continued to fish for krill, along with some other nations through the 1990s. In the mid-2000s, you can see that the catches started to go up again. Um, that was predominantly with the, with the entry of Norway into the fishery and also to some extent China. And you can see that over that sort of time scale, the fisheries operation has moved from being somewhat circumpolar and in the East Antarctic to almost now almost solely operating in that area in the Southwest Atlantic. Um, and so in the, in the last decade, the fishery catches have increased, but the area of operation to some extent has decreased. So that's a very potted history of the krill fishery. So there's been changes in the catch levels 
changes in who's taking the catches and changes in where those catches have been coming from. When the fishery started, it was basically a free-for-all. There was no management regime in place. And it was that recognition even then, uh, so has been talking about that central role of krill in the ecosystem, that, that led to a concern that if, if the krill fishery started and increased pretty quickly, if it went the way that lots of other fisheries have gone, where they start off, increase pretty quickly and then just collapse, that would be pretty catastrophic for the whole of the Antarctic food web. So it was that concern that led to the negotiation of the convention which established Camelar as the body to manage fishing in the Antarctic. And that's, at that time it was very much focused on becoming the krill parliament. Well, it wasn't really, but that's, that was the, the emphasis was on managing krill. And because the krill fishery now operates almost solely in that area in the southwest Atlantic, you can see on the, the plot here is the area shaded in grey. In order to manage the fishery in that area, the first thing you need to know is, well, how much krill is there? And that's a, that's a pretty major undertaking. It's a very large area. And actually, the last major survey was a multi-vessel, multi-member, multinational survey in 2000, which surveyed the whole of that area in grey using shipboard acoustics. And although that was quite some time ago, there are smaller scale surveys done almost annually in that area that show there hasn't really been any change in the krill abundance since then. Contrary to what you might hear or what people might suggest, um, there really isn't any evidence for a major decline in krill at all in the, in the last two decades. So once we know how much krill is there, we can go about a process of setting a precautionary catch limit. And the reason I say precautionary catch limit is because of the way that Camelar was set up. It's not just about managing the fishery. It's about managing the impact that that fishery has in the ecosystem within that fishery takes place. So recognising the importance of krill, it's about making sure that we don't have an impact on the penguins and the seals and whales that also need to feed on that krill. And so we have a, a precautionary approach, which means that rather than setting catch limits high and, and then seeing if it's a problem, set them low, and then, then the fishery can expand if we get the data to understand that that expansion isn't going to have an effect. Rather than setting a very high catch limit, realising the problem, and then trying to fix it, which, um, which doesn't, in, generally in fisheries and in life, doesn't work quite so well. So from that survey in the area of, of the Antarctic, we have a, a, an estimate of about 60 million tonnes of krill. And through a series of mathematical models and computer simulations, we can run different simulations to see, well, what would be the effect on the krill and on the dependent predators of different levels of catch. And I won't go into the detail of that process. It takes a long time. A lot of people are a great deal cleverer than I am doing it. But we come up with a catch limit that's about 9% of that population and it's about 5 million tonnes per year. So that's a catch limit that you could take from that krill population that we think wouldn't impact the krill population and it wouldn't adversely impact the predators that feed on krill. But you'll recall that that's a very large area and the fishery itself only actually operates in a relatively small part of that area and kind of unfortunately the fishery tends to operate just in those areas that are close to islands or to land masses, which are really good for penguins to have their colonies on. And it's also where we know that lots of seals and whales aggregate in those areas. So unsurprisingly, the fishery operates in the same areas that the predators like to go to that feed on krill, because they're all basically trying to do the same thing. But it means that you don't want the whole of that 5 million tonnes taken from just one of those small places. If it's spread out evenly, it might not have an impact on the krill population or those predators. But if you took it all from one place, then the likelihood is that it would have the sort of effect that we certainly don't want to see in our management approach. So what Kamalar has done is said, until there's a way of making sure we can spread out that fishery to make sure there's not a localised impact anywhere, we're going to cap the fishery at 620,000 tonnes. Now, 620,000 tonnes has some historical basis. It's also 
it was also sort of mashed out in some political discussions and darkened smoky rooms way back in the day when Kamala didn't meet here, they met at Rest Point Casino. Um, well, I was still at school then, so I can't take any credit or blame for anything that went on then. Um, but there are some people in this room who, who were there. <laughs> and they know who they are. So we have this cap on the fishery at 620,000 tonnes. And just to ensure that even that 620,000 tonnes isn't taken in one place, so we call that the trigger level because it's a trigger. If we went above that, we'd have to have a different management system in place. We actually divide that 620,000 tonnes into three other portions. You recall on that plot there were three areas where the fishery took place and they're around different locations in the Antarctic region, that, that southwest Atlantic around the islands of South Georgia, the South Orkneys and down in the Antarctic Peninsula. In the last few years that catch limit in the Antarctic Peninsula has been reached I think maybe in four or five of the last in the last four or five years. This year I think we closed that fishery on the 1st of July when the fishery reached that catch limit. And reaching a catch limit sometimes in a fishery starts to spark concern in people, well the fishery must be, must be getting too big. But actually the way that this is being managed from that 60 million tonnes to start with to a catch limit of 5 million tonnes to something like 155,000 tonnes, actually that 155,000 tonnes is only 0.3% of the krill population and I have to admit that with the best will in the world we're not be, we aren't able to measure the size of the krill population to within 0.3 of a percent, probably plus or minus 20%. So at the moment, and obviously the big question a lot of people ask me and, and anyone else involved in the krill fishery is, is it sustainable? Are the catches of krill that we're taking at the moment sustainable? And I would say that if the catches of krill that have been taken at the moment are not sustainable, given our current understanding of that ecosystem, then just about all of the scientists who've worked on krill over the last 30 years have got it wrong. And I'm pretty confident that they haven't. So I would say that at the moment, the catch levels for krill are sustainable. That doesn't mean we can be complacent about the future, but at the moment, the catch levels are really very small in comparison to the size of the population. But in terms of managing a fishery and sort of the operational elements of managing a fishery, it's not just about setting a catch limit. You need to know what's actually going on in the fishery and day to day, this is the sort of information that flows from the Antarctic into this building so that we can manage the krill fishery. The first thing that we need to do is know who's going to be there and who's going to be taking part in that fishery. And only members of the commission, so only the people who can fly one of these flags can fish for krill. And in order to do so, they have to give prior notification the year before. So we already know which vessels are authorised to fish for krill next year. So as part of that, we need to know which vessels, um, which areas they've asked to go fishing in, because it's not just a, a free-for-all, there's only certain areas that they can fish for krill in, and also what gear they're going to use, so what size nets. All of those nets have to be adapted to have an escape panel in them, which allows any fur seals or other things that get into the net to escape so we don't catch them. And also some vessels that use, um, if you like, a traditional fishing method where you pull your net through the water, haul it up, dump it on deck and sort through the catch. Other ones that, that don't do that, they leave the net in the water, but they pump the cod end with a, an airflow water pump. So they're just catching fresh krill on the vessel all of the time. They can leave the net um, in the water for much longer periods and have a very steady stream of krill coming onto the vessel. So we know which vessels are going to take part. When they enter the Kamala Convention area, they have to send a message to us here to let us know, and then we can monitor what they're doing. Um, they have to report their catches. When the fishery is quite a long way away from the catch limit, they can report monthly as they get closer to it. They have to report every five days. We have other fisheries that we monitor that have to report their catches to us every day. And then we can see how the catch is progressing towards the catch limit so we can then notify all of the vessels the fishery is going to close. And as I said earlier, we did that for the krill fishery in the Antarctic Peninsula this year. That closed on the 1st of July. All of the vessels have to have a vessel monitoring system, so a satellite linked um, location indicator. So we know that the vessels, once the fishery is closed, they have to leave the area uh, and we know that 
we can we can check up to make sure that they they do that so that's the within season monitoring and then we get every haul or every time period for the vessels that leave the nets in the water for longer and, and pump the cod end out um, we get information on where and when and how deep the water was and how deep their net was for every haul that they undertake we also have scientific observers on probably about 90 percent of the cruel vessels now will be moving to 100 um, percent in three years time so they're measuring krill, seeing what sex, um, what's, what stage they're at. Also checking to see if there's any fish bycatch that's taken with the krill as well. And other elements of the broader ecosystem impacts that that fishery might be having. We bring all that data together in, in this, this building, but also in, in different members who are engaged in that fishery. Bring those scientific analyses forward, along with that other information about the notification of vessels, who's going to fish, the within season monitoring, and that's the sort of information that we bring together. So when the commission meets in October, they have the information with which to make decisions about how we manage the fishery. So all of the krill fishery happens an awful long way away from here, right at the other side of the Antarctic. All that information flows into this building. This quiet little building on Macquarie Street is the hub of where the krill fishery is being managed. One of the the key messages, I suppose, is that we know that the krill fishery has changed over the time that's been operating. Different countries involved, different locations, different catches. Um, those catches are, I would say, currently under, at sustainable levels or well below sustainable levels. And obviously it's our management objective to make sure that I could stand here in 20 years time and say exactly the same thing. Um, well, perhaps not me, but somebody else. Um, but one of the, the key things that has changed um, is that the, I guess in the, in the early part of the krill fishery, the emphasis was on collecting marine protein to, to feed the masses, if you like. This was a, seen as a big source of an expanding human population um, and the, potentially this massive source of marine protein. And that increase more recently in the fishery is much more driven by a change in the market for krill and in particular um, for krill oil and that's one of the things that that's driven particularly the, the Norwegian interest in a high value commercial product in getting krill oil um, for the nutraceutical and, and pharmaceutical markets so there's different drivers for an expansion in the krill fishery but of course we have to be mindful of the sort of work that SO's been doing in the longer term about the effects of things like ocean acidification. That, that we're looking there at say, sort of 50 to 100 year timescales, where we're probably not managing the fishery in decision making at those sort of timescales. But obviously we want to ensure that we have that sort of sustainability in the longer term. But one of the most, I would say one of the most interesting developments is that change in the market towards things like krill oil, and um, that's the other connection that we have in Hobart. So we have the aquarium at AAD doing that cutting edge research on, um, on what's going, what might happen to krill in the future. We have, so if you sort of drive through, if you come from Margate or you've got to the fork in the road to do some DIY shopping and you come past the AAD, then that's the first of those sort of krill connections drive down Southern Outlet, come down Macquarie Street, come past here, then that's where the fishery's managed. And if you keep going down at the bottom to the traffic lights, turn left, and you go past the Menzies Research Institute, which is where the next of our cruel connections comes in. And I'm gonna pass across to Laura, who's gonna explain about the uses of krill and how that research has been conducted in Hobart. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, about um, our use of krill oil a bit. Um, and, uh, as Keith has just said, that um, I don't have any krill in tanks um, and I'm not managing the fishery, but I am looking um, at a use um, of krill oil in human health. So our research group at the Menzies Institute in Hobart um, is working to find treatments for osteoarthritis. So our research interest is, um, is musculoskeletal health. Um, and we're doing that because there's some evidence that krill oil might be helpful for treating knee osteoarthritis. So I'm going to talk to you first about um, osteoarthritis. It's the most common form of arthritis. There are over 100 different forms of arthritis and osteoarthritis mostly affects older adults. And the symptoms of osteoarthritis include joint pain and stiffness, 
uh, and this leads to disability and damage to structures within the joint. So people who have osteoarthritis, um, in the long term, um, the main treatment is knee replacement, but hopefully um, people won't get there. But basically, once everything else fails, um, you're looking at a knee replacement. Um, and so um, our job is to try and make sure that we can treat osteoarthritis well and we can stop people from getting there. So treatments for osteoarthritis need to do two things. Number one, they need to reduce pain and disability. And number two, they need to change the course of the disease. So what we really want to be doing is to be slowing down um, the, the, the path of, of any individual with osteoarthritis towards a knee replacement. And mostly I'm talking about knee osteoarthritis today because that's where my expertise is. But osteoarthritis affects the large joints. So people have osteoarthritis in their hips um, and you can have osteoarthritis in your hands as well. Predominantly treatments for osteoarthritis at the moment focus on reducing the pain and disability. So treatments are essentially, uh, uh, that's what, that's what we, we focus on. And that is in part because it's important. I mean, that's what patients tell us is most important to them. Is, is pain um, and, um, and their limitations on daily life. Um, but secondly, treatments focus on, on the pain and disability because the second aspect, which is the changing of the disease course over time, has largely failed. That's quite disappointing, that essentially what we, what we have been doing in the past in osteoarthritis treatment is actually treating the symptoms and not really treating the cause. And even with treatment, over half of people with osteoarthritis are still in pain and we do have some treatments that um, do change the disease course, but they're all experimental. Um, some of these we've actually done in our centre in Hobart, um, but they're not approved by regulators at the moment. So we need more treatments. And so that's, um, so that's why we're interested in krill oil. Uh, so at the moment, what happens for most people is they go and see their GP, they get some treatments which you know, might include drugs, but might include other things. And then the next thing that happens usually is they get sent, sent to see the orthopaedic surgeon um, and we know for a number of reasons um, that's, not, that's not good. And, in, and if, if nothing else, it's not sustainable. It's, ex it's expensive to be giving people joint replacements. There are a number of different types of osteoarthritis, um, so subtypes. Um, we think that one of the reasons for the failure of the treatments in osteoarthritis is it's been treating everyone as if they had the same disease. But actually we know um, that, that they don't. That's actually not true. There are, na there are actually many pathways um, towards, um, towards pain and towards disability um, and um, because there, there are many, many, um, many parts of the joint and the joint um, works as an organ. And one of the subtypes of osteoarthritis that we know of um, is inflammation. So localised inflammation in the knee, which is known as effusion, so that's a, a, that's a swollen, fat, hot knee. This is one type of osteoarthritis that we've been focusing on. And um, so this localised inflammation is important because it predicts pain. Now you might also be thinking about um, one of the types of, of arthritis that's well known is rheumatoid arthritis. And that type of arthritis is where you have inflammation everywhere and you have very high levels of inflammation. But inflammation in the context of osteoarthritis is very localised. And so this localised inflammation um, predicts pain, especially um, pain, what we would call non-weight bearing pain. So that would be pain when you're doing what you're doing now, you're sitting, you might be lying down in bed trying to sleep. So that sort of pain is typically an inflammatory pain. And the bigger the swelling in your knee, the greater the pain. So stopping the cascade of inflammation is the key. And, and this is how we're planning to slow the path to knee replacement. And so this is the only medical picture I've got for you tonight. So this is what, um, what swelling looks like on an MRI. You can see the, um, the kneecap the, on the left hand side. So if you imagine someone facing that way, this is a slice through their knee. And so the green bits in there um, are, um, are some swelling on the inside of the knee. So this particular um, picture is taken from um, one of our longitudinal studies. So we've looked at people and followed them over time, just looking at what happens. We didn't treat them. And the panel on the left um, is at baseline, so at the beginning. And the second panel is two and a half years later. So for this particular person, the swelling inside their joint um, got smaller. Um, and the technical term for what we're looking at is effusion synovitis. All that means is that um, we actually can't differentiate between um, some of the things we're seeing on these MRIs. And that's because for research scans, we actually choose not to give people um, the chemical that would be required to see the difference because um, it's not, very, not safe enough for research patients. So you can see 
those green bits um, on, the, um, on the slide and so that's actually what we're looking at inside the knee. So if you see it from outside the knee, it's a hot fat knee. If you see it from the inside of the knee, you can see, um, you can see bits of fluid um, that, um, that are actually quite clear on the MRI. So I'm going to take a step sideways for a moment and talk about how we're going to know that a treatment works. So the last slide I showed you, I said that was from one of the studies where we've just looked at people over time. We didn't treat them, we just looked at what was happening over time. Um, and so that's called an observational study, but a really important tool we have in medical research is, is the randomised trial. So this is a way of, of helping you know, work out whether a treatment works. So we randomly assign people, you know, suitable people to receive one treatment or another, and we follow them over time and see what happens. And you might be thinking, why are we bothering with this? Can't we just give people something and see what happens? But we can't, um, certainly not in pain trials. And that's because in, in osteoarthritis and in other painful conditions, people's pain is not the same all the time. So people go through cycles of pain. So today you might have a lot of pain, maybe because you um, went for a long walk yesterday, but today your pain might be better. But also that the pain cycles are longer than that. And um, you know, they just they fluctuate over time related to maybe factors to do with the disease or maybe activity or maybe nothing at all. Or nothing that we know of, for example. So we typically in a, in a clinical trial see people when they're in a lot of pain. Maybe they see an ad in the paper and think, my knee really hurts. I think that I might go and try some of that. And maybe if your knee doesn't hurt, well, you might just scroll past and read something else in the newspaper. So uh, in our trials, typically we see people when they're in a lot of pain and then um, over time the, and their pain will go down and this fluctuation is normal and is part of the disease process. What I've just described is in part called natural history. So we know that people's pain changes over time. If we're recording what's happening to someone, there's also what we call the Hawthorne effect, the effect of being watched or observed. You know, you talk to a nice researcher, you know, the doctor asks you some questions. Um, and then there might be the placebo effect, which is the effect of being given a treatment that you think might work. And then there's the effect of the drug. So if you, if you don't do the sorts of trials that we're talking about, how are you going to know what the effect of the drug is compared to all these other things we're talking about? So doing these sorts of trials in medical research is really important because that's what helps us work out what the effect of the drug is. And it also gives us an opportunity to figure out what the side effects might be, or in fact, um, anything else that um, might be important. I've told you why it's important that we do these trials. So back to osteoarthritis. And I promise this is my only bad joke for the talk. So the, um, the use of marine oils in arthritis um, has, a, um, has a history going back a few years. Yeah, it is a pretty bad joke, isn't it? Sorry. The use of marine oils dates back to the 1990s. So fish oil has been successfully used to treat rheumatoid arthritis since the early 90s, and we know that the omega-3 fatty acids in the fish oil switch off inflammation. And the clinical trials um, have shown that, um, that fish oil reduces pain, morning stiffness, the number of painful and tender joints and use of pain medicines, and it increases the likelihood that someone will go into remission um, when used as well as the standard therapies. So that's a good news story if you've got rheumatoid arthritis, fish oil is good for you. But we have a problem as far as osteoarthritis is concerned, that we know that fish oil does not work in osteoarthritis. So a two-year trial of high-dose fish oil versus low-dose fish oil in people with knee osteoarthritis, some of which patients came from Hobart and were looked at in our centre, this two-year trial showed that the knee symptoms reduced more in the low-dose group, which was supposed to do nothing, compared to the high-dose group. So this has shown us that fish oil doesn't work in osteoarthritis, or conversely that perhaps canola oil does. So that's contrary to what we were expecting, but certainly it tells us that it doesn't have the effect in osteoarthritis that it did in rheumatoid arthritis. And there's been some evidence in krill oil that krill oil might in fact work, but I've just told you that fish oil doesn't work, so why might krill oil work? Well, krill oil is high in the omega-3 fatty acids that are also occurring in fish oil, although the chemical structures are a little different. But krill oil also has antioxidants, which fish oil doesn't. Might this be the magic ingredient? Well, we're not sure. But in terms of the two marine oils, the bioavailability of the krill oil is better. So that means that for a given amount of oil, you would get more of the good things in it. 
um, which is important for you know the biomass and you know amount in appeal and all that sort of stuff. So there's evidence to say that quill oil has beneficial effects on inflammation and oxidation and therefore may be a better treatment for osteoarthritis than fish oil. Then we move on to some of the evidence. So given that you can buy krill oil in every pharmacy, every supermarket, how many trials do you think there might be in osteoarthritis? This is it, one trial. And in fact, there are three other trials I've been able to find in human health, that's it. So the evidence base is certainly not anywhere near as strong as fish oil and one would say is encouraging but not strong. So the one trial in, in, of krill oil for osteoarthritis um, looked at um, 90 middle-aged adults in people with three disease groups, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. And certainly from the fish oil story that I've just told you, there's certainly important reasons to think that people with rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis might respond differently to krill oil. So this study looked at treating them with a low dose over a month and looked at various aspects of the disease that we're, uh, we know are important and has shown that krill oil begins to work by four weeks and is potentially as early as two weeks. So this suggests that krill oil reduces pain and systemic inflammation within two to four weeks. So that's great. So not only is there evidence that it's reducing pain, which is important to patients, there's also evidence that it might be modifying what's going on in the knee which is also very, very important. And there were no side effects reported. So we know that krill oil is, is very safe, but most people would take um, any medicine for more than 30 days. So, and that's not very long to look at side effects. So as I've said, there's gaps in this study. There's only one of them. Um, it went for a month and it was low dose. And the participants were a mix of a couple of different medical conditions and there wasn't any analysis that allowed us to look at any of those groups individually. And there was no imaging data. So I've shown you some of the scans from our research studies. We really want to know what's going on in the knee. Um, and there's, there was no data in this study for that. And that the, the gold standard for um, osteoarthritis these days is MRI. Well, x-rays are, are, are good, but they're a hundred year old technology and there's many things you can't see on them. So we use MRIs. Obviously there must be a need for a bigger, better study. And so our group has been successful in getting funding to do just that. So I'm hoping that if I was, in, if I was standing here in two years, I'd be able to tell you what the effect of krill oil was in people with knee osteoarthritis um, who have um, inflammation type of osteoarthritis. But we're not there yet, we're here today. So, so today that I can tell you that we've got funding to do a, a longer, larger study. And so we've gotten funding from Australia's um, largest medical research funding body to do that. And so we've already started in Hobart. One of our centres is, is yet to start. So we are running this study in Hobart, Adelaide, Melbourne, Perth and Sydney. Um, and we'll be recruiting about 60 patients from each, each site. And so we've, we've now um, well and truly started in Hobart. And we're recruiting um, older adults with um, severe knee pain and knee osteoarthritis using a high dose of krill oil and we're collecting data on the pain and also um, some information on what's going on with the knee um, and so that we're hoping to find out whether it does change pain as we expect that it will, whether it will change um, uh, inflammation um, and other aspects of, um, of lipid metabolism. It's really exciting to um, you know, to be here to be able to talk to you about this and actually I'm so excited to see these amazing krill. I'd never seen these before tonight. And to think that these krill from the Southern Ocean, you know, um, you know being well managed um, and being, um, you know, hopefully that they've, um, that they actually do work for osteoarthritis and these little guys can, um, can help us. So um, that's all I um, wanted to talk about tonight and I think we're moving on to the next, um, the next section, thank you. So I go back to the question that we posed on our flyer. Are we in the krill capital of the world? And you know I'm biased. If we, if we start um, with our, our journey from the south, because that's where krill come from, and the first place, the first stop in our krill connections is down there at um, the AAD at Kingston. And so we have a little krill on the map there. We have a little krill on the map for us here at, at Camelar. And then another little one just around the corner um, at, at Menzies. 
And we've been able to make those links now, I think much stronger by, by doing this sort of presentation and putting this together. But if we zoom into Hobart and we say, well, where are the sort of cruel connections there? You can see we've still got those, the cruel connection here and down the road at Menzies. But if we start to put on all the other places that you can find krill in Hobart, you can see we start to fill in that map. And that's not exhaustive. That's just supermarkets, chemist warehouse, all the places you could go and buy a krill oil tablet. So now, most, most urban conurbations that have shops and things like that will have all those extra krill on there. But I would say that nowhere else has the big three linkages that we put on. There's also IMAS, of course, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that, well, both Zoe and I have students down at IMAS working on crew related projects. But there's probably nowhere else in the world that you've got the medical research, the fisheries management, and the, the cutting edge sort of climate change research and being able to see live krill. So I would, I would challenge anyone to say that Hobart is not the krill capital of the world. And it's a lovely place too.